part one of the long run by edith wharton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by matt berard the long run by edith wharton the shade of those our days that had no tongue part one it was last winter after a twelve years absence from new york that i saw again at one of the jim cumnor's dinners my old friend halston merrick the cumnor's house is one of the few where even after such a lapse of time one can be sure of finding familiar faces and picking up old threads where for a moment one can abandon one's self to the illusion that new york humanity is a shade less unstable than its bricks and mortar and that evening in particular i remember feeling that there could be no pleasanter way of re-entering the confused and careless world to which i was returning than through the quiet softly lit dining-room in which mrs cumnor with a characteristic sense of my needing to be broken in gradually had contrived to assemble so many friendly faces i was glad to see them all including the three or four i did not know or failed to recognize but had no difficulty in passing as in the tradition and of the group but i was most of all glad as i rather wonderingly found to set eyes again on halston merrick he and i had been at harvard together for one thing and had shared their curiosities and orders a little outside the current tendencies had on the whole been more critical than our comrades and less amenable to the accepted then for the next following years merrick had been a vivid and promising figure in young american life handsome careless and free he had wandered and tasted and compared after leaving harvard he had spent two years at oxford then he had accepted a private secretaryship to our ambassador in england and had come back from this adventure with a fresh curiosity about public affairs at home and the conviction that men of his kind should play a larger part in them this led first to his running for a state senatorship which he failed to get and ultimately to a few months of intelligent activity in a municipal office soon after being deprived of this post by a change of party he had published a small volume of delicate verse and a year later an odd uneven brilliant book on municipal government after that one hardly knew where to look for his next appearance but chance rather disappointingly solved the problem by killing off his father and placing halston at the head of the merrick iron foundry at yonkers his friends had gathered that whenever this regrettable contingency should occur he meant to dispose of the business and continue his life of free experiment as often happens in just such cases however it was not the moment for a sale and merrick had to take over the management of the foundry some two years later he had a chance to free himself but when it came he did not choose to take it this tame sequel to an inspiriting start was disappointing to some of us and i was among those disposed to regret merrick's drop to the level of the prosperous then i went away to a big engineering job in china and from there to africa and spent the next twelve years out of sight and sound of new york doings during that long interval i heard of no new phase in merrick's evolution but this did not surprise me as i had never expected from him actions resonant enough to cross the globe all i knew and this did surprise me was that he had not married and that he was still in the iron business all through those years however i never ceased to wish in certain situations and at certain turns of thought that merrick were in reach that i could tell this or that to merrick i had never in the interval found any one with just his quickness of perception and just his sureness of response after dinner therefore we irresistibly drew together 
in mrs cumnor's big easy drawing-room cigars were allowed and there was no break in the communion of the sexes and this being the case i ought to have sought a seat beside one of the ladies among whom we were allowed to remain but as had generally happened of old when merrick was in sight i found myself steering straight for him past all minor ports of call there had been no time before dinner for more than the barest expression of satisfaction at meeting and our seats had been at opposite ends of the longish table so that we got our first real look at each other in the secluded corner to which mrs cumnor's vigilance now directed us merrick was still handsome in his stooping tawny way handsomer perhaps with thinnish hair and more lines in his face than in the young excess of his good looks he was very glad to see me and conveyed his gladness by the same charming smile but as soon as we began to talk i felt a change it was not merely the change that years and experience and altered values bring there was something more fundamental the matter with merrick something dreadful unforeseen unaccountable merrick had grown conventional and dull in the glow of his frank pleasure in seeing me i was ashamed to analyze the nature of the change but presently our talk began to flag fancy a talk with merrick flagging and self-deception became impossible as i watched myself handing out platitudes with the gesture of the salesman offering something to a purchaser equally good the worst of it was that merrick merrick who had once felt everything didn't seem to feel the lack of spontaneity in my remarks but hung on them with a harrowing faith in the resuscitating power of our past it was as if he hugged the empty vessel of our friendship without perceiving that the last drop of its essence was dry but after all i am exaggerating through my surprise and disappointment i felt a certain sense of well-being in the mere physical presence of my old friend i liked looking at the way his dark hair waved away from the forehead at the tautness of his dry brown cheek the thoughtful backward tilt of his head the way his brown eyes mused upon the scene through lowered lids all the past was in his way of looking and sitting and i wanted to stay near him and felt that he wanted me to stay but the devil of it was that neither of us knew what to talk about it was this difficulty which caused me after a while since i could not follow merrick's talk to follow his eyes in their roaming circuit of the room at the moment when our glances joined his head paused on a lady seated at some distance from our corner immersed at first in the satisfaction of finding myself again with merrick i had been only half aware of this lady as of one of the few persons present whom i did not know or had failed to remember there was nothing in her appearance to challenge my attention or to excite my curiosity and i don't suppose i should have looked at her again if i had not noticed that my friend was doing so she was a woman of about forty-seven with fair faded hair and a young figure the gray dress was handsome but ineffective and her pale and rather serious face wore a small unvarying smile which might have been pinned on with her ornaments she was one of the women in whom increasing years show rather what they have taken than what they have bestowed and only on looking closely did one see that what they had taken must have been good of its kind phil cumnor and another man were talking to her and the very intensity of the attention she bestowed on them betrayed the strain of rebellious thoughts she never let her eyes stray or her smile drop and at the proper moment i saw she was ready with the proper sentiment the party like most of those that mrs cumnor gathered about her was not composed of exceptional beings the people of the old vanished new york set were not exceptional they were mostly cut on the same convenient and unobtrusive pattern but they were often exceedingly nice 
and this obsolete quality marked every look and gesture of the lady i was scrutinizing while these reflections were passing through my mind i was aware that merrick's eyes rested still on her i took a cross-section of his look and found in it neither surprise nor absorption but only a certain sober pleasure just about at the emotional level of the rest of the room if he continued to look at her his expression seemed to say it was only because all things considered there were fewer reasons for looking at anybody else this made me wonder what were the reasons for looking at her and as a first step toward enlightenment i said i'm sure i've seen the lady over there in gray merrick detached his eyes and turned them on me with a wondering look seen her you know her he waited don't you know her it's mrs reardon i wondered that he should wonder for i could not remember in the cumnor group or elsewhere having known any one of the name he mentioned but perhaps he continued you hadn't heard of her marriage you knew her as mrs trent i gave him back his stare not mrs philip trent yes mrs philip trent not paulina yes paulina he said with a just perceptible delay before the name in my surprise i continued to stare at him he averted his eyes from mine after a moment and i saw that they had strayed back to her you find her so changed he asked something in his voice acted as a warning signal and i tried to reduce my astonishment to less unbecoming proportions i don't find that she looks much older no only different he suggested as if there were nothing new to him in my perplexity yes awfully different i suppose we're all awfully different to you i mean coming from so far i recognize all the rest of you i said hesitating and she used to be the one who stood out most there was a flash a wave a stir of something deep down in his eyes yes he said that's the difference i see it she she looks worn down soft but blurred like the figures in that tapestry behind her he glanced at her again as if to test the exactness of my analogy life wears everybody down he said yes except those it makes more distinct they're the rare ones of course but she was rare he stood up suddenly looking old and tired i believe i'll be off i wish you'd come down to my place for sunday no don't shake hands i want to slide away unawares he had backed away to the threshold and was turning the noiseless doorknob even mrs cumnor's doorknobs had tact and didn't tell of course i'll come i promised warmly in the last ten minutes he had begun to interest me again all right good-bye half through the door he paused to add she remembers you you ought to speak to her i'm going to but tell me a little more i thought i saw a shade of constraint on his face and did not add as i had meant to tell me because she interests me what wore her down instead i asked how soon after trent's death did she remarry he seemed to make an effort of memory it was seven years ago i think and is reardon here to-night yes over there talking to mrs Conner. i looked across the broken groupings and saw a large glossy man with straw-coloured hair and a red face whose shirt and shoes and complexion seemed all to have received a coat of the same expensive varnish as i looked there was a drop in the talk about us and i heard mr reardon pronounce in a big booming voice what i say is what's the good of disturbing things thank the lord i'm content with what i've got is that her husband what's he like oh the best fellow in the world said merrick going end of part one of the long run by edith wharton
part two of the long run by edith wharton this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt ferrard merrick had a little place at riverdale where he went occasionally to be near the ironworks and where he had his weekends when the world was too much with him here on the following saturday afternoon i found him awaiting me in a pleasant setting of books and prints and faded parental furniture we dined late and smoked and talked afterward in his book-walled study till the terrier on the hearth-rug stood up and yawned for bed when we took the hint and moved toward the staircase i felt not that i had found the old merrick again but that i was on his track had come across traces of his passage here and there in the thick jungle that had grown up between us but i had a feeling that when i finally came on the man himself he might be dead as we started upstairs he turned back with one of his abrupt shy movements and walked into the study wait a bit he called to me i waited and he came out in a moment carrying a limp folio it's typewritten will you take a look at it i've been trying to get to work again he explained thrusting the manuscript into my hand what poetry i hope i exclaimed he shook his head with a gleam of derision no just general considerations the fruit of fifty years of inexperience he showed me to my room and said good night the following afternoon we took a long walk inland across the hills and i said to merrick what i could of his book unluckily there wasn't much to say the essays were judicious polished and cultivated but they lacked the freshness and audacity of his youthful work i tried to conceal my opinion behind the usual generalizations but he broke through these feints with a quick thrust to the heart of my meaning it's worn down blurred like the figures in the commoner's tapestry i hesitated it's a little too damned resigned i said ah he exclaimed so am i resigned he switched the bare brambles by the roadside a man can't serve two masters you mean business and literature no i mean theory and instinct the gray tree and the green you've got to choose which fruit you'll try and you don't know till afterward which of the two has the dead core how can anybody be sure that only one of them has i'm sure said merrick sharply we turned back to the subject of his essays and i was astonished at the detachment with which he criticized and demolished them little by little as we talked his old perspective his old standards came back to him but with the difference that they no longer seemed like functions of his mind but merely like attitudes assumed or dropped at will he could still with an effort put himself at the angle from which he had formerly seen things but it was with the effort of a man climbing mountains after a sedentary life in the plain i tried to cut the talk short but he kept coming back to it with nervous insistence forcing me into the last retrenchments of hypocrisy and anticipating the verdict i held back i perceived that a great deal immensely more than i could see a reason for had hung for him on my opinion of his book then as suddenly his insistence dropped and as if ashamed of having forced himself so long on my attention he began to talk rapidly and uninterestingly of other things we were alone again that evening and after dinner wishing to efface the impression of the afternoon and above all to show that i wanted him to talk about himself i reverted to his work you must need an outlet of that sort when a man's once had it in him as you have and when other things begin to dwindle he laughed your theory is that a man ought to be able to return to the muse as he comes back to his wife after he's ceased to interest other women no as he comes back to his wife after the day's work is done a new thought came to me as i looked at him you ought to have had one i added he laughed again 
a wire you mean so that there have been someone waiting for me even if the news decamped he went on after a pause i've a notion that the kind of woman worth coming back to wouldn't be much more patient than the muse but as it happens i never tried because for fear they'd chuck me i put them both out of doors together he turned his head and looked past me with a queer expression at the low panel door at my back out of that very door they went the two of them on a rainy night like this and one stopped and looked back to see if i wasn't going to call her and i didn't and so they both went End of part two. Part three of The Long Run by Edith Wharton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Part three. The news, said Merrick, refilling my glass and stooping to pat the terrier as he went back to his chair well you've met the muse in the little volume of sonnets you used to like and you've met the woman too and you used to like her though you didn't know her when you saw her the other evening no i won't ask you how she struck you when you talked to her i know she struck you like that stuff i gave you to read last night she's confirmed i've conformed she's conformed i've conformed the mills have caught us and ground us ground us oh exceedingly small but you remember what she was and that's the reason why i'm telling you this now you may recall that after my father's death i tried to sell the works i was impatient to free myself from anything that would keep me tied to new york i don't dislike my trade and i've made in the end a fairly good thing of it but industrialism was not at that time in the line of my tastes and i know now that it wasn't what i was meant for above all i wanted to get away to see new places and rub up against different ideas i had reached a time of life the top of the first hill so to speak where the distance draws one and everything in the foreground seems tame and stale i was sick to death of the particular set of conformities i had grown up among sick of being a pleasant popular young man with a long line of dinners on my list and the dead certainty of meeting the same people or their prototypes at all of them well i failed to sell the works and that increased my discontent i went through moods of cold unsociability alternating with sudden flushes of curiosity when i gloated over stray scraps of talk overhead in railway stations and omnibuses when strange faces that i passed in the street tantalized me with fugitive promises i wanted to be among things that were unexpected and unknown but it seemed to me that nobody about me understood in the least what i felt but that somewhere just out of reach there was someone who did and whom i must find or despair it was just then that one evening i saw mrs trent for the first time yes i know you wonder what i meant i'd known her of course as a girl i'd met her several times after her marriage and i'd lately been thrown with her quite intimately and continuously during a succession of country house visits but i had never as it happened really seen her it was at a dinner at the commoners and there she was in front of the very tapestry we saw her against the other evening with people about her and her face turned from me and nothing noticeable or different in her dress or manner and suddenly she stood out for me against the familiar unimportant background and for the first time i saw a meaning in the stale phrase of the pictures walking out of its frame for after all most people are just that to us pictures furniture the inanimate accessories of our little island area of sensation and then sometimes one of these graven images moves and throws out live filaments toward us and the line they make draws us across the world as the moon track 
seems to draw a boat across the water there she stood and as this queer sensation came over me i felt that she was looking steadily at me that her eyes were voluntarily consciously resting on me with the weight of the very question i was asking i went over and joined her and she turned and walked with me into the music room earlier in the evening some one had been singing and there were low lights there and a few couples still sitting in those confidential corners of which mrs cumnor has the art but we were under no illusion as to the nature of these presences we knew that they were just painted in and that the whole of life was in us too flowing back and forward between us we talked of course we had the attitudes even the words of the others i remember her telling me her plans for the spring and asking me politely about mine as if there were the least sense in plans now that this thing had happened when we went back into the drawing-room i had said nothing to her that i might not have said to any other woman of the party but when we shook hands i knew we should meet the next day and the next that's the way i take it that nature has arranged the beginning of the great enduring loves and likewise of the little epidermal flurries and how is a man to know where he is going from the first my feeling for paulina trent seemed to me a grave business but when the enemy is given to producing that illusion many a man i am talking of the kind with imagination has thought he was seeking a soul when all he wanted was a closer view of its tenement and i tried honestly tried to make myself think i was in the latter case because in the first place i didn't just then want a big disturbing influence in my life and because i didn't want to be a dupe and because paulina trent was not according to hearsay the kind of woman for whom it was worth while to bring up the big batteries but my resistance was only half-hearted what i really felt all i really felt was the flood of joy that comes of heightened emotion she had given me that and i wanted her to give it to me again that's as near as i've ever come to analyzing my state in the beginning i knew her story as no doubt you know it the current version i mean she had been poor and fond of enjoyment and she had married that pompous stick philip trump because she needed a home and perhaps also because she wanted a little luxury queer how we sneer at women for wanting the thing that gives them half their attraction people shook their heads over the marriage and divided prematurely into philip's partisans and hers for no one thought it would work and they were almost disappointed when after all it did she and her wooden concert seemed to get on well enough there was a ripple at one time over her friendship with young jim dollop who was always with her during a summer at newport and had an autumn in italy then the talk died out and she and trump were seen together as before on terms of apparent good fellowship this was the more surprising because from the first paulina had never made the least attempt to change her tone or subdue her colors in the gray tramp atmosphere she clashed with prismatic fires she smoked she talked subversively she did as she liked and went where she chose and danced over the tramp prejudices and the tramp principles as if they'd been a ballroom floor and all without apparent offense to her solemn husband and his cloud of cousins i believe her frankness and directness struck them dumb she moved like a kind of primitive una through the virtuous rout and never got a finger mark on her freshness one of the finest things about her was the fact that she never for an instant used her situation as a means of enhancing her attraction with a husband like tramp it would have been so easy he was a man who always saw the small sides of big things he thought most of life compressible into a set of bylaws and the rest unmentionable and with his stiff frock-coated and tall-hatted mind instinctively distrustful of intelligences in another dress 
with his arbitrary classification of whatever he didn't understand into the kind of thing i don't approve of the kind of thing that isn't done and deepest depth of all the kind of thing i'd rather not discuss he lived in bondage to a shadowy moral etiquette of which the complex rites and awful penalties had cast an abiding gloom upon his manner a woman like his wife couldn't have asked a better foil yet i'm sure she never consciously used his dullness to relieve her brilliancy she may have felt that the case spoke for itself but i believe her reserve was rather due to a lively sense of justice and to the rare habit you said she was rare of looking at facts as they are without any throwing of sentimental limelights she knew trant could no more help being trant than she could help being herself and there was an end of it i've never known a woman who made up so little mentally perhaps her very reserve the fierceness of her implicit rejection of sympathy exposed her the more to well to what happened when we met she said afterward that it was like having been shut up for months in the hold of a ship and coming suddenly on deck on a day that was all flying blue and silver i won't try to tell you what she was it's easier to tell you what her friendship made of me and i can do that best by adopting her metaphor of the ship haven't you sometimes at the moment of starting on a journey some glorious plunge into the unknown been tricked out by the thought if only one hadn't to come back well with her one had the sense that one would never have to come back that the magic ship would always carry one farther and what an air one breathed on it and oh the wind and the islands and the sunsets i said just now her friendship and i used the word advisedly love is deeper than friendship but friendship is a good deal wider the beauty of our relation was that it included both dimensions our thoughts met as naturally as our eyes it was almost as if we loved each other because we liked each other the quality of a love may be tested by the amount of friendship it contains and in our case there was no dividing line between loving and liking no disproportion between them no barrier against which desire beat in vain or from which thought fell back unsatisfied ours was a robust passion that could give an open-eyed account of itself and not a beautiful madness shrinking away from the proof for the first months friendship sufficed us or rather gave us so much by the way that we were in no hurry to reach what we knew it was leading to but we were moving there nevertheless and one day we found ourselves on the borders it came about through a sudden decision of trance to start on a long tour with his wife we had never foreseen that he seemed rooted in his new york habits and convinced that the whole social and financial machinery of the metropolis would cease to function if he did not keep an eye on it through the columns of his morning paper and pronounce judgment on it in the afternoon at his club but something new had happened to him he caught a cold which was followed by a touch of pleurisy and instantly he perceived the intense interest and importance which ill health may add to life he took the fullest advantage of it a discerning doctor recommended travel in a warm climate and suddenly the morning paper the afternoon club fifth avenue wall street all the complex phenomena of the metropolis faded into insignificance and the rest of the terrestrial globe from being a mere geographical hypothesis useful in enabling one to determine the latitude of new york acquired reality and magnitude as a factor in the convalescence of mr philip trent his wife was absorbed in preparations for the journey to move him was like mobilizing an army and weeks before the date set for their departure it was almost as if she were already gone this foretaste of separation showed us what we were to each other yet i was letting her go and there was no help for it no way of preventing it resistance was as useless as vain struggles in a nightmare 
she was trent's and not mine part of his luggage when he travelled as she was part of his household furniture when he stayed at home the day she told me that their passages were taken it was on a november afternoon in her drawing-room in town i turned away from her and going to the window stood looking out at the torrent of traffic interminably pouring down fifth avenue i watched the senseless machinery of life revolving in the rain and mud and tried to picture myself performing my small function in it after she had gone from me it can't be it can't be i exclaimed what can't be i came back into the room and sat down by her this this i hadn't any words two weeks i said what's two weeks she answered vaguely something about their thinking of spain for the spring two weeks two weeks i repeated and the months we've lost the days that belong to us yes she said i'm thankful it's settled our words seemed irrelevant haphazard it was as if each were answering a secret voice and not what the other was saying don't you feel anything at all i remember bursting out at her as i asked it the tears were streaming down her face i felt angry with her and was almost glad to note that her lids were red and that she didn't cry becomingly i can't express my sensation to you except by saying that she seemed part of life's huge league against me and suddenly i thought of an afternoon we had spent together in the country on a ferny hillside when we had sat under a beech tree and her hand had lain palm upward in the moss close to mine and i had watched a little black and red beetle creeping over it the bell rang and we heard the voice of a visitor and the click of an umbrella in the umbrella stand she rose to go into the inner drawing-room and i caught her suddenly by the wrist you understand i said that we can't go on like this i understand she answered and moved away to meet her visitor as i went out i heard her saying in the other room yes we're really off on the twelfth end of section three part four of the long run by edith wharton this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. part four i wrote her a long letter that night and waited two days for a reply on the third day i had a brief line saying that she was going to spend sunday with some friends who had a place near riverdale and that she would arrange to see me while she was there that was all it was on a saturday that i received the note and came out here the same night the next morning was rainy and i was in despair for i had counted on her asking me to take her for a drive or a long walk it was hopeless to try to say what i had to say to her in the drawing-room of a crowded country house and only eleven days were left i stayed indoors all the morning fearing to go out lest she should telephone me but no sign came and i grew more and more restless and anxious she was too free and frank for coquetry but her silence and evasiveness made me feel that for some reason she did not wish to hear what she knew i meant to say could it be that she was after all more conventional less genuine than i had thought i went again and again over the whole maddening round of conjecture but the only conclusion i could rest in was that if she loved me as i loved her she would be as determined as i was to let no obstacle come between us during the days that were left the luncheon hour came and passed and there was no word from her i had ordered my trap to be ready so that i might drive over as soon as she summoned me but the hours dragged on the early twilight came and i sat here in this very chair or measured up and down up and down the length of this very rug until there was no message and no letter it had grown quite dark and i had ordered away impatiently the servant who came in with the lamps i couldn't bear any definite sign that the day was over and i was standing there on the rug staring at the door and noticing a bad crack in its panel when i heard the sound of wheels on the gravel 
a word at last no doubt a line to explain i didn't seem to care much for her reasons and i stood where i was and continued to stare at the door and suddenly it opened and she came in the servant followed her with a light and then went out and closed the door her face looked pale in the lamplight but her voice was as clear as a bell well she said you see i've come i started toward her with hands outstretched you've come you've come i stammered yes it was like her to come in that way without dissimulation or explanation or excuse it was like her if she gave at all to give not furtively or in haste but openly deliberately without stenting the measure or counting the cost but her quietness and serenity disconcerted me she did not look like a woman who has yielded impetuously to an uncontrollable impulse there was something almost solemn in her face the effect of it stole over me as i looked at her suddenly subduing the huge flush of gratified longing you're here 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 i kept repeating like a child singing over a happy word you said she continued in her grave clear voice that we couldn't go on as we were ah it's divine of you i held up my arms to her she didn't draw back from them but her faint smile said wait and lifting her hands she took the pens from her hat and laid the hat on the table as i saw her dear head bare in the lamplight with the thick hair waving away from the party i forgot everything but the bliss and wonder of her being here here in my house on my hearth that fourth rose from the corner of the rug is the exact spot where she was standing i drew her to the fire and made her sit down in the chair you're in and knelt down by her and hid my face on her knees she put her hand on my head and i was happy to the depths of my soul oh i forgot she exclaimed suddenly i lifted my head and our eyes met hers were smiling she reached out her hand opened the little bag she had tossed down with her hat and drew out a small object from it i left my trunk at the station here's the check can you send for it she asked her trunk she wanted me to send for her trunk oh yes i see your smile you lucky man only you see i didn't love her in that way i knew she couldn't come to my house without running a big risk of discovery and my tenderness for her my impulse to shield her was stronger even then than vanity or desire judged from the point of view of those emotions i fell terribly short of my part i hadn't any of the proper feelings such an act of romantic folly was so unlike her that it almost irritated me and i found myself desperately wondering how i could get her to reconsider her plan without well without seeming to want her to it's not the way a novel hero feels it's probably not the way a man in real life ought to have felt but it's the way i felt and she saw it she put her hands on my shoulders and looked at me with deep deep eyes then you didn't expect me to stay she asked i caught her hands and pressed them to me stammering out that i hadn't dared to dream you thought i'd come just for an hour how could i dare think more i adore you you know for what you've done but it wouldn't be known if you if you stayed on my servants everybody about here knows you i've no right to expose you to the risk she made no answer and i went on tenderly give me if you will the next few hours there's a train that will get you to town by midnight and then we'll arrange something in town where it's safer for you more easily managed it's beautiful it's heavenly of you to have come but i love you too much i must take care of you and think for you i don't suppose it ever took me so long to say so few words and though they were profoundly sincere they sounded unutterably shallow irrelevant and grotesque she made no effort to help me out but sat silent listening with her meditative smile it's my duty dearest as a man i rambled on the more i love you the more i'm bound yes but 
you don't understand she interrupted she rose as she spoke and i got up also and we stood and looked at each other i haven't come for a night if you want me i've come for always she said here again if i give you an honest account of my feelings i shall write myself down as the poor-spirited creature i suppose i am there wasn't i swear at the moment a grain of selfishness of personal reluctance in my feeling i worshipped every hair of her head when we were together i was happy when i was away from her something was gone from every good thing but i had always looked on our love for each other our possible relation to each other as such situations are looked on in what is called society i had supposed her for all her freedom and originality to be just as tacitly subservient to that view as i was ready to take what she wanted on the terms on which society concedes such taking and to pay for it by the usual restrictions concealments and hypocrisies in short i suppose that she would play the game look out for her own safety and expect me to look out for it it sounds cheap enough put that way but it's the rule we live under all of us and the amazement of finding her suddenly outside of it oblivious of it unconscious of it left me for an awful minute stammering at her like a graceless dolt perhaps it wasn't even a minute but in it she had gone the whole round of my thoughts it's raining she said very low i suppose you can telephone for a trap there was no irony or resentment in her voice she walked slowly across the room and paused before the brangwen etching over there that's a good impression will you telephone please she repeated i found my voice again and with it the power of movement i followed her and dropped at her feet you can't go like this i cried she looked down on me from heights and heights i can't stay like this she answered i stood up and we faced each other like antagonists you don't know i accused her passionately in the least what you are asking me to ask of you yes i do everything she breathed and it's got to be that or nothing oh on both sides she reminded me not on both sides it's not fair that's why why you won't why i cannot may not why you'll take a knife and not a life the taunt for a woman usually so sure of her aim fell so short of the mark that its only effect was to increase my conviction of her helplessness the very intensity of my longing for her made me tremble where she was fearless i had to protect her first and think of my own attitude afterward she was too discerning not to see this too her face softened grew inexpressibly appealing and she dropped again into that chair your end leaned forward and looked up with her grave smile you think i'm beside myself raving you're not thinking of yourself i know i'm not i never was saner since i've never known you i've often thought this might happen this thing between us isn't an ordinary thing if it had been we shouldn't all these months have drifted we should have wanted to skip to the last page and then throw down the book we shouldn't have felt we could trust the future as we did we were in no hurry because we knew we shouldn't get tired and when two people feel that about each other they must live together or part i don't see what else they can do a little trip along the coast won't answer it's the high seas or else being tied up to levy wharf and i'm for the high seas my dear think of sitting here here in this room in this chair and listening to that and seeing the light on her hair and hearing the sound of her voice i don't suppose there ever was a scene just like it she was astounding inexhaustible through all my anguish of resistance i found a kind of fierce joy in following her it was lucidity at white heat the last sublimation of passion she might have been an angel arguing a point in the empyrean if she hadn't been so completely a woman pleading for her life her life that was the thing at stake she couldn't do with less of it 
than she was capable of and a woman's life is inextricably part of the man's she cares for that was why she argued she couldn't accept the usual solution couldn't enter into the only relation that society tolerates between people situated like ourselves yes she knew all the arguments on that side didn't i suppose she'd been over them and over them she knew for hadn't she often said it of others what is said of the woman who by throwing in her lot with her lovers binds him to a lifelong duty which has the irksomeness without the dignity of marriage oh she could talk on that side with the best of them only she asked me to consider the other the side of the man and woman who love each other deeply and completely enough to want their lives enlarged and not diminished by their love what in such a case she reasoned must be the inevitable effect of concealing denying disowning the central fact the motive power of one's existence she asked me to picture the course of such a love first loving first working as a fever in the blood distorting and deflecting everything making all other interests insipid all other duties irksome and then as the acknowledged claims of life regained their hold gradually dying the poor starved passion for want of the wholesome necessary food of common living and doing yet leaving life impoverished by the loss of all it might have been i'm not talking dear i see her now leaning toward me with shining eyes i'm not talking of the people who haven't enough to fill their days and to whom a little mystery a little manoeuvring gives an illusion of importance that they can't afford to miss i'm talking of you and me with all our tastes and curiosities and activities and i ask you what our love would become if we had to keep it apart from our lives like a pretty useless animal that we went to peep at and feed with sweetmeats through its cage i won't my dear fellow go into the other side of our strange duel the arguments i used were those that most men in my situation would have felt bound to use and that most women in paulina's accept instinctively without even formulating them the exceptionalness the significance of the case lay wholly in the fact that she had formulated them all and then rejected them there was one point i didn't of course touch on and that was the popular conviction which i confess i shared that when a man and a woman agree to defy the world together the man really sacrifices much more than the woman i was not even conscious of thinking of this at the time though it may have lurked somewhere in the shadow of my scruples for her but she dragged it out into the daylight and held me face to face with it remember i'm not attempting to lay down any general rule she insisted i am not theorizing about man and woman i am talking about you and me how do i know what's best for the woman in the next house very likely she'll vote when it would have been better for her to stay at home and it's the same with the man he'll probably do the wrong thing it's generally the weak heads that commit follies when it's the strong ones that ought to and my point is that you and i are both strong enough to behave like fools if we want to take your own case first because in spite of the sentimentalists it's the man who stands and lose most you'll have to give up the iron works which you don't much care about because it won't be particularly agreeable for us to live in new york which you don't care much about either but you won't be sacrificing what is called a career you made up your mind long ago that your best chance of self-development and consequently of general usefulness lay in thinking rather than doing and when we first met you were already planning to sell out your business and travel and write well those ambitions are of a kind that won't be harmed by your dropping out of your social setting on the contrary such work as you want to do ought to gain by it because you'll be brought nearer to life as it is in contrast to life as a visiting list she threw back her head with a sudden laugh <laughs> and the joy of not having any more visits to make i wonder if you've ever thought of that just at first i mean for society is getting so deplorably lax that little by little it will edge up to us 
you'll see i don't want to idealize the situation dearest and i won't conceal from you that in time we shall be called on but oh the fun we shall have in the interval and then for the first time we shall be able to dictate our own terms one of which will be that no bores need apply think of being cured of all one's chronic bores we shall feel as jolly as people do after a successful operation i don't know why this nonsense sticks in my mind when some of the graver things we said are less distinct perhaps it's because of a certain iridescent quality of feeling that made her gaiety seem like sunshine through a shower you ask me to think of myself she went on but the beauty of but the beauty of our being together will be that for the first time i shall dare to now i have to think of all the tedious trifles i can pack the days with because i'm afraid i'm afraid to hear the voice of the real me down below in the windowless underground hole where i keep her remember again please it's not woman it's paulina trapp i'm talking of the woman in the next house may have all sorts of reasons honest reasons for staying there there may be someone there who needs her badly for whom the light would go out if she went whereas to philip i've been simply well what new york was before he decided to travel the most important thing in life till he made up his mind to leave it and now merely the starting place of several lines of steamers oh i didn't have to love you to know that i only had to live with him if he lost his eyeglasses he'd think it was the fault of the eyeglasses he'd really feel that the eyeglasses had been careless and he'd be convinced that no others would suit him quite as well but at the opticians he'd probably be told that he needed something a little different and after that he'd feel that the old eyeglasses had never suited him at all and that that was their fault too at one moment but i don't recall when i remember she stood up with one of her quick movements and came towards me holding out her arms oh my dear i'm pleading for my life do you suppose i shall ever want for arguments she cried after that for a bit nothing much remains with me except a sense of darkness and conflict the one spot of daylight in my whirling brain was the conviction that i couldn't whatever happened profit by the sudden impulse she had acted on and allowed her to take in a moment of passion a decision that was to shape her whole life i couldn't so much as lift my little finger to keep her with me then unless i were prepared to accept for her as well as for myself the full consequences of the future she had planned for us well there's the point i wasn't i felt in her poor fatuous idiot that i was that lack of objective imagination which had always seemed to me to account at least in part for many of the so-called heroic qualities in women where their feelings are involved they simply can't look ahead her unfaltering logic notwithstanding i felt this about paulina as i listened she had a specious air of knowing where she was going but she didn't she seemed the genius of logic and understanding but the demon of illusion spoke through her lips i said just now that i hadn't at the outset given my own side of the case a thought it would have been truer to say that i hadn't given it a separate thought but i couldn't think of her without seeing myself as a factor the chief factor in her problem and without recognizing that whatever the experiment made of me that it must fatally in the end make of her if i couldn't carry the thing through she must break down with me we should have to throw our separate selves into the melting pot of this mad adventure and be one in a terrible indissoluble completeness of which marriage is only an imperfect counterpart there could be no better proof of her extraordinary power over me and of the way she had managed to clear the air of sentimental illusion than the fact that i presently found myself putting this before her with a merciless precision of touch if we love each other enough to do a thing like this we must love each other enough to see just what it is we're going to do so i invited her to the dissecting table and i see now the fearless eye 
with which she approached the cadaver for that's what it is you know she flashed out at me at the end of my long demonstration it's a dead body like all the instances and examples and hypothetical cases that ever were what do you expect to learn from that the first great anatomist was the man who stuck his knife in a heart that was beating and the only way to find out what doing a thing will be like is to do it she looked away from me suddenly as if she were fixing her eyes on some vision on the outer rim of consciousness no there's one other way she exclaimed and that is not to do it to abstain and refrain and then see what we become or what we don't become in the long run and to draw our inferences that's the game that almost everybody about us is playing i suppose there's hardly one of the dull people one meets at dinner who hasn't had just once the chance of a berth on a ship that was off for the happy isles and hasn't refused it for fear of sticking on a sandbank i'm doing my best you know she continued to see the sequel as you see it as you believe it's your duty to me to see it i know the instances you're thinking of the listless couples wearing out their lives in shabby watering places and hanging on the favour of hotel acquaintances or the proud quarrelling wretches shut up alone in a fine house because they're too good for the only society they can get and trying to cheat their boredom by squabbling with their tradesmen and spying on their servants no doubt there are such cases but i don't recognize either of us in those dismal figures why to do it would be to admit that our life yours and mine is in the people about us and not in ourselves that we're parasites and not self-sustaining creatures and that the lives we're leading now are so brilliant full and satisfying that what we should have to give up would surpass even the blessedness of being together at that stage i confess the solid ground of my resistance began to give way under me it was not that my convictions were shaken but that she had swept me into a world whose laws were different where one could reach out in directions that the slave of gravity hasn't pictured but at the same time my opposition hardened from reason into instinct i knew it was her voice and not her logic that was unsettling me i knew that if she'd written out her thesis and sent it me by post i should have made short work of it and again the part of me which i called by all the finest names my chivalry my unselfishness my superior masculine experience cried out with one voice you can't let a woman use her graces to her own undoing you can't for her own sake let her eyes convince you when her reasons don't and then abruptly and for the first time a doubt entered me a doubt of her perfect moral honesty i don't know how else to describe my feeling that she wasn't playing fair that in coming to my house in throwing herself at my head i called things by their names she had perhaps not so much obeyed an irresistible impulse as deeply deliberately reckoned on the dissolvent effect of her generosity her rashness and her beauty from the moment that this mean doubt raised its head in me i was once more the creature of all the conventional scruples i was repeating before the looking-glass of my self-consciousness all the stereotyped gestures of the man of honour oh the sorry figure i must have cut you'll understand my dropping the curtain on it as quickly as i can yet i remember as i made my point being struck by its impressiveness i was suffering and enjoying my own suffering i told her that whatever step we decided to take i owed it to her to insist on its being taken soberly deliberately no it's advisedly isn't it oh i was thinking of the marriage service she interposed with a faint laugh that if i accepted there on the spot her headlong beautiful gift of herself i should feel i had taken an unfair advantage of her an advantage which she would be justified in reproaching me with afterward that i was not afraid to tell her this because she was intelligent enough to know that my scruples were the surest proof of the quality of my love that i refused to owe my happiness to an unconsidered impulse that we must see each other again in her own house in less agitating 
circumstances when she had had time to reflect on my words to study her heart and look into the future the factitious exhilaration produced by uttering these beautiful sentiments did not last very long as you may imagine it fell little by little under her quiet gaze a gaze in which there was neither contempt nor irony nor wounded pride but only a tender wistfulness of interrogation and i think the acutest point in my suffering was reached when she said as i ended oh yes of course i understand if only you hadn't come to me here i blurted out in the torture of my soul she was on the threshold when i said it and she turned and laid her hand gently on mine there was no other way she said and at the moment it seemed to me like some hackneyed phrase in a novel that she had used without any sense of its meaning i don't remember what i answered or what more we either of us said at the end a desperate longing to take her in my arms and keep her with me swept aside everything else and i went up to her pleading stammering urging i don't know what but she held me back with a quiet look and went i had ordered the carriage as she had asked me to and my last definite recollection is of watching her drive off in the rain i had her promise that she would see me two days later at her house in town and that we should then have what i called a decisive talk but i don't think that even at the moment i was the dupe of my phrase i knew and she knew that the end had come end of part four part five of the long run by edith wharton this recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. part five it was about that time merrick went on after a long pause that i definitely decided not to sell the works but to stick to my job and conform my life to it i can't describe to you the rage of conformity that possessed me poetry ideas all the picture-making processes stopped a kind of dull self-discipline seemed to me the only exercise worthy of a reflecting mind i had to justify my great refusal and i tried to do it by plunging myself up to the eyes into the very conditions i had been instinctively struggling to get away from the only possible consolation would have been to find in a life of business routine and social submission such moral compensations as may reward the citizen if they fail the man but to attain to these i should have had to accept the old delusion that the social and the individual man are two now on the contrary i found soon enough that i couldn't get one part of my machinery to work effectively while another wanted feeding and that in rejecting what had seemed to me a negation of action i had made all my action negative the best solution of course would have been to fall in love with another woman but it was long before i could bring myself to wish that this might happen to me then at length i suddenly and violently desired it and as such impulses are seldom without some kind of imperfect issue i contrived a year or two later to work myself up into the wish for state she was a woman in society and with all the awe of that institution that paulina lacked our relation was consequently one of those unavowed affairs in which triviality is the only alternative to tragedy luckily we had on both sides risked only as much as prudent people stake in a drawing-room game and when the match was over i take it that we came out fairly even my game at all events was of an unexpected kind the adventure had served only to make me understand paulina's abhorrence of such experiments and at every turn of the slight intrigue i had felt how exasperating and belittling such a relation was bound to be between two people who had they been free would have made it openly and so from a brief phase of imperfect forgetting i was driven back to a deeper and more understanding remembrance the second incarnation of paulina was one of the strangest episodes of the whole strange experience things she had said during our 
extraordinary talk things i had hardly heard at the time came back to me with a singular vividness and a fuller meaning i hadn't any longer the cold consolation of believing in my own perspicacity i saw that her insight had been deeper and keener than mine i remember in particular starting up in bed one sleepless night as there flashed into my head the meaning of her last words there was no other way the phrase i had half smiled at at the time as a parrot-like echo of the novel heroine's stock farewell i had never up to that moment wholly understood why paulina had come to my house that night i had never been able to make that particular act which could hardly in the light of her subsequent conduct be dismissed as a blind surge of passion square with my conception of her character she was at once the most spontaneous and the steadiest-minded woman i had ever known and the last to wish to owe any advantage to surprise to unpreparedness to any play on the spring of sex the better i came retrospectively to know her the more sure i was of this and the less intelligible her act appeared and then suddenly after a night of hungry restless thinking the flash of enlightenment came she had come to my house had brought her trunk with her had thrown herself at my head with all possible violence and publicity in order to give me a pretext a loophole an honourable excuse for doing and saying why precisely what i had said and done as the idea came to me it was as if some ironic hand had touched an electric button and all my fatuous phrases had leapt out on me in fire of course she had known all along just the kind of thing i should say if i didn't at once open my arms to her and to save my pride my dignity my conception of the figure i was cutting in her eyes she had recklessly and magnificently provided me with the decentest pretext a man could have for doing a pusillanimous thing with that discovery the whole case took a different aspect it hurt less to think of paulina and yet it hurt more the tinge of bitterness of doubt in my thoughts of her had had a tonic quality it was harder to go on persuading myself that i had done right as bit by bit my theories crumbled under the test of time yet after all as she herself had said one could judge of results only in the long run the trance stayed away for two years and about a year after they got back you may remember trent was killed in a railway accident you know fate's way of untying a knot after everybody has given up tugging at it well there i was completely justified all my weaknesses turned into merits i had saved a weak woman from herself i had kept her to the path of duty i had spared her the humiliation of scandal and the misery of self-reproach and now i had only to put out my hand and take my reward i had avoided paulina since her return and she had made no effort to see me but after trant's death i wrote her a few lines to which she sent a friendly answer and when a decent interval had elapsed i asked if i might call on her she answered at once that she would see me i went to her house with a fixed intention of asking her to marry me and i left it without having done so why i don't know that i can tell you perhaps you would have had to sit there opposite her knowing what i did and feeling as i did to understand why she was kind she was compassionate i could see that she didn't want to make it hard for me perhaps she even wanted to make it easy but there between us was the memory of the gesture i hadn't made forever parodying the one i was attempting there wasn't a word i could think of that hadn't an echo in it of words of hers i had been deaf to there wasn't an appeal i could make that didn't mock the appeal i had rejected i sat there and talked of her husband's death of her plans of my sympathy and i knew she understood and knowing that in a way made it harder the doorbell rang and the footman came in to ask if she would receive other visitors she looked at me a moment and said yes and i got up and shook hands and went away a few days later she sailed for europe 
and the next time we met she had married reardon end of part five part six of the long run by edith wharton this recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. it was long past midnight and the terriers hence became imperious merrick rose from his chair pushed back a fallen log and put up the fender he walked across the room and stared a moment at the brangling etching before which paulina trant had paused at a memorable turn of their talk then he came back and laid his hand on my shoulder she summed it all up you know when she said that one way of finding out whether a risk is worth taking is not to take it and then to see what one becomes in the long run and draw one's inferences the long run well we've run it she and i i know what i've become but that's nothing to the misery of knowing what she's become she had to have some kind of life and she married reardon reardon's a very good fellow in his way but the worst of it is that it's not her way no the worst of it is that now she and i meet as friends we dine at the same houses we talk about the same people we play bridge together and i lend her books and sometimes reardon slaps me on the back and says come in and dine with us old man what you want is to be cheered up and i go and dine with them and he tells me how jolly comfortable she makes him and what an ass i am not to marry and she presses on me a second helping of poulet maryland and i smoke one of reardon's cigars and at half past ten i get into my overcoat and walk back alone to my rooms end of part six end of the long run by edith wharton